Hello, and welcome to another edition of the Hobbit Cast. Um, I'm your host, Ben McDonald, and we've got Karen with us. Today, Hello. we're, we're going to be talking about insulin resistance. Uh, first things first, just want to throw a quick plug out for our good friend Scott, the Hobbit, and uh, their cookbook, uh, Ketofy Everything. You can find that at shecallsmehobbit.com forward slash store. Check it out. Lots of great pictures uh, and it's available in hardback or ebook. So, Karen, how are you doing today? I'm doing fairly well. Fairly how's well. Your, how's your insulin resistance doing, Karen? <laughs> my, my insulin resistance is is misbehaved today. Um, oh. I'm a little bit under the weather, so I woke up a little high. I was in the 120s, and normally I've been waking up below 100. Well, I'm sorry to hear you're not feeling well, and you know, we certainly don't need any more sugar in your blood than we than we normally would have. I don't. No. <laughs> so in today's show, we're going to be talking about insulin, what it is. We're going to talk a little bit about insulin resistance and why it's the enemy for health. We'll probably touch on diabetes a little bit and then get into how we can monitor what the current state of your insulin resistance is. And then we're going to talk a little bit about fasting as healing. And, and intermittent fasting seems to be the topic du jour. And mm -hmm. uh, insulin resistance has only got one way to resolve, and that is to provide an insulin holiday. And that, that can be done with medication, but it can be done a whole lot simpler by not putting food in your face. So we're going to talk about that and some of the approaches that we're familiar with based on the research from Dr. Fung. How's that sound, Karen? That sounds great to me. Cool. Well, let's kick it off by talking about uh, what is insulin. So insulin is this little hormone that is created by your pancreas. That's mm. what that thing is for. <laughs> and it is the hormone that signals uh, to the liver to make adjustments to your uh, blood sugar level. But then it more importantly signals to uh, your muscle tissue to uptake uh, glucose from the, the bloodstream. So when you have sugar in your blood, so let, let's say I ate a big donut. I've got this big bolus of sugar that comes flying down my gullet and it gets into my blood. The pancreas says, hey, look at look at all this uh, sugar hanging around here. You know what we really need to do is get that that sugar shuttled into your muscle tissue so that your muscles can use it for energy. So insulin is the signaling hormone that uh, tells those muscle cells to be receptive and to be uh, uh, to approach that, that glucose that's floating around randomly in your blood and actually suck it into the individual cells to be used as energy. That also uh, will affect the, the fat tissues, your adipose tissue. And uh, if there's excess, you know, it'll, it'll suck a little bit of that too uh, through a much more complicated metabolic process. So, all uh, right. Um, insulin resistance, I think, is a much more interesting topic because if you are obese, if you are someone who has lived a high carb diet for a long time, it's likely that you've managed to pummel your body with a uh, ridiculous amount of insulin. And I, I think that that causes a couple of health problems. Karen, when you think about insulin resistance, what's on your mind about why that's a problem? Um. Well, with me, um, I had a trip to the doctor about a, a year ago, I guess, and um, my uh, my tests indicated uh, prediabetes, which is uh, a lot of insulin resistance, and I, mm -hmm. I was well on my way um, to becoming a, a type two diabetic. At, uh, it was three hundred and five pounds. Oof. And um, my body was just not handling the sugar anymore. Um, so I was I was storing a lot of it as fat. <laughs> so let me rewind there because I think you talked about a really important point that we want to ring the bell really loud on, which is diabetes is a disease that is characterized by insulin resistance. 
diabetes yeah. is insulin resistance. That's the manifestation yeah. of it. Yeah, that's that's how it begins. That's sort of the the warning shot across the bow. Um, I was told by my doctor with the prediabetes that once that's indicated, you have less than eight years um, guaranteed. You will have uh, full blown type two. It it never takes longer than that. And doctor, doctor words for that are uh, diabetes is a progressive disease. It starts out very small yep. and you can see it coming, you know, that 5, 10, 15 years in advance because your fasted blood sugar starts creeping up, which is that indicator that you're building resistance to insulin. Yeah. So they, what is the common um, progression of that disease? H had you not made any interventions, what do you think would have happened? Well, the recommendation was, you know, you are obese, lose weight, or we're going to have to discuss um, medications in tablet form, usually metformin. Mm -hmm. And then eventually injection, which I already had to do when I was pregnant and I didn't want to have to do again. Oh, so you had a gestational diabetes. I did. I had gestational diabetes and... Um, no matter what I did, <laughs> I still had to inject more and more and more insulin until I got towards the end of my pregnancy. Now, can you just fix that by eating a gluten-free diet? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, you can't. I was very, very careful with my diet um, when I was pregnant. Uh, I, I did everything they told me to, and I still had to increase uh, the number of units I had every night before I went to bed because even Oof. though I'm fairly certain I wasn't eating in my sleep, <laughs> um, I was waking up very high. Wow. Like in the 200 range. That's spooky, man. That's yeah. real spooky. Yeah. It, but it's not fun, no. <laughs> All right. So, you know, diabetes is a, a real scary disease. Uh, one of the things that we're really excited about in our group is the fact that uh, if you go to standard uh, American medical definitions of diabetes, it is a progressive disease. It only goes one way. It never gets better. It only gets worse, and it continues to progress throughout your life. If you will start out on an oral medication, then you start out on very small amounts of injectable medication. And by the time you're dead, you're injecting massive amounts of insulin to manage what is essentially a, a resistance to a, a hormone that's floating around in your body. Yeah. Now, we know from the, the research of many doctors, uh, not least of which is uh, Dr. Fung and Dr. Westman, that you can make profound changes in your insulin resistance by eating a low-carb diet and by reducing the exposure to uh, that insulin hormone uh, through diet and nutritional timing. So that, that's what we're really excited about. Ketogenic diet is an easy way to manage your insulin levels and allow many people, especially if you catch it before you've done physical damage to the pancreas, mm -hmm. you can put your diabetes in remission uh, in full reversal to where it's completely unmedicated and undetectable medical condition, which means you are now a normal person by definition. So let's talk a little bit about how you would know, you know, I, if we've probably got a lot of people out there that are now going, oh man, I'm, I'm 50 pounds overweight. I, maybe I'm pre-diabetic or maybe I'm insulin resistant. How, how could I tell that? Well, if, if you're 50 pounds overweight, very likely you are insulin resistant. Uh-huh. Uh, a good way to check is um, your your waking blood glucose levels. All right. So, so when you, you would, yeah, you would take a very uh, simple blood test in the morning, just with a glucose meter, a little pick of the finger, and um, if uh, you're over ninety, there there's a, a certain amount of insulin resistance going on. If you're already following the ketogenic diet. Yeah, I, I think what that really comes down to is when you're eating a ketogenic diet, you're not eating sugar. 
So right. the only sugar in your system is being created by your liver through a, a complex metabolic process called gluconeogenesis. That's not important. But <laughs> when you're not eating sugar, your blood sugar should be relatively static. It should kind of be a flat line between 80 and 90 or maybe even lower. Yeah. So when it's not, that is an indication that there's something wrong. So when, when you're talking about, you know, the little prick your finger test, I mean, these are not expensive machines, right? These blood glu glucose monitors. No, they aren't. I think they're like $140 Canadian, which is $25 American. Is that the conversion rate? <laughs> Something like that. The, the one that I had was, was free. It was zero loonies. Oh, nice. Um, zero loonies when, when I purchased the strips. The strips, uh, I don't know what they are in the States. In Canada, they're about 75 cents. Yeah. Per, per test. The tests can be a lot cheaper. In America, you can go to like Walmart or some of these lower cost mm -hmm. uh, you know, places like Target or even on Amazon. The one that I have, I got off Amazon for $25. It came with 50 tests and, you know, 50 little finger prickers. Like it's everything you need for 25 bucks to do 50 tests, yeah. which, which is a lot because you're only doing this once or twice a day. Normally, you wouldn't be testing it a whole bunch of times unless you're diabetic. Yeah. And at Walmart, I think the machine, there's a there's a brand, uh, the Walmart in-house brand is called a Rely On. It's like $15 for the machine and $10 for 50 tests. It's very cheap, very affordable. So it's certainly something that is not going to break the bank for you to pick up this piece of equipment. Now, mm -hmm. there, there are a couple of neat tricks you can do with the, the blood glucose monitors. Have, have you come up with anything fun that you figured out with your monitor besides your uh, fasted blood sugar? Well, uh, with mine, uh, I, I can test my fasted blood sugar. It also gives me the average um, over the last you know week, month, and I can see it gradually improving, which is okay. nice. H have you done any of the sweetener testing stuff? Oh, yeah. Um, I... Um, I do fast quite a bit, <laughs> as I'm always talking about. Yes. Um, and uh, in order to keep my stomach calm and, and curb sort of, uh, you know, the rumbly tumbly, I was having diet soda, which I didn't think would be a big deal because it was zero calories. So I of could, course, zero calories, zero I carbs. Have right? that it will. Um, but what I didn't realize is that I was having... Uh, uh, cephalic, is that the word I'm looking for? Cephalic uh, based right. insulin response. I was having a massive dump of insulin after I would have this sweetened beverage. Mm. Um, and it happened with every sweetener. I, I tried sweetened tea with stevia and I don't like stevia. Plus aspartame. Um, I tried erythritol, all of them. And um, what was happening was I'd have this and then insulin would be released just from me tasting something that, that was that sweet. And I would find myself, you know, my usually during the day if I'm fasting, my blood glucose is in the mid 90s. I'd have this and all of a sudden I would be in the low 80s, maybe 75. I was mm -hmm. having a, a 20 point reduction because I was releasing insulin and that was sort of defeating the purpose of the fasting, which was to give my pancreas a break. So let me pause and uh, just uh, drill into that a little bit. So what you were doing is you on, on a basically an empty stomach, you would test your blood sugar. It would be 90. It would be, yeah, it would be 90, 95. I, I would you, have a soda. You'd have your soda. And it would be yeah, 80. So uh, you, you would test like 45 minutes, an hour later? 45 minutes later. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you would see that drop in blood glucose, which you would expect it to be unchanged or maybe even rise just a little bit. Exactly. But for it to drop profoundly, and 20 points is a profound drop. It is. And, I, you know, I'd start to get a little hungry. Ooh, that little carb craving kind of. A little bit because all something. of a sudden my blood sugar is getting kind of low. So, Karen, I, I'm not calling you a dog. I'm comparing you to a dog. <laughs> and, and that is Pavlov's dog. Yeah, but that bell was ringing. What, what we're talking about when, when she's using that fancy word of cephalac response, what she's actually meaning 
is the Pavlovian dog response where he would ring the bell and the dog would drool. Just that act of sweetness, even though it had no carbs, just the act of sweetness and swallowing. It, Karen has beat up her system so much with sugary foods and carby foods that mm -hmm. she would have a anticipatory reaction of insulin come flying out of nowhere yep. just based on the thought. I, yeah, just the thought of having something sweet because normally when you have something sweet, that's because there's a donut that's about to hit your tummy. Yep. So they, it was just anticipating the flood and it would get in front of it. This is a very common problem in the obese and the pre-diabetic. And it is um, what causes a lot of problems for people. When we, when we have folks that are saying, hey, I'm eating ketogenic, but I'm not losing any weight. I can't figure out what's going on. You start poking into it and you go, well, what? tell me everything that you eat. And you'll find out about diet sodas or some crazy, uh, you know, they're doing, uh, you know, all these keto cookies or yeah. uh, Quest bars or Atkins milkshakes and stuff like that. And you yeah. start going, well, what if we just eliminated that and really stuck with uh, steak, chicken and broccoli just for just for three days? And then, boom, they lose four pounds in those three days. You go, what what changed? Well, you, you're you someone who is having a response to food that is in your head. You're hearing that bell ringing and your your pancreas is drooling. <laughs> We're getting it, ready. <laughs> it, it's an unfortunate problem and it's going to be different in every person. Yeah. But that's why a lot of times, uh, I don't know if you do this, when I get the PM that's like, hey, I'm stalled. One of my first questions is, have you got a blood glucose monitor? And let me see your food diary because yep. I, I want to know what's going on with the blood glucose. And I want to know, uh, I mean, we just recently we had a friend of ours talking about uh, their blood glucose dropping, you know, 10 or 15 points out of nowhere on something that shouldn't cause that. And that, that, that's not insulin resistance. That That's a, a insulin release of anticipation. Yes. So that's not the good. Yep. Let's so keep, hold on to your fat a little bit. Yeah, I, I wanted to hit that point because it comes up so much. I, I just wanted to talk through that a little bit more. Okay, so back to the blood glucose monitors. What what would we do if someone came to us and say, hey, I got my $25 blood glucose monitor. How do I tell if I'm insulin resistant? What what's what does that look like? Well, you you would test upon waking. So um Let's say you wake up at 6.30 a.m. You know, within the first uh, half hour upon rising before you eat, mm -hmm. you test your fasted blood glucose level. And that is the, the easiest way to, to tell if you're, you're over 90 and you've been following your ketogenic diet. Then uh, there is going to be a little bit of uh, insulin resistance that you're dealing with if you're over those levels. Yeah. And I, the real crystal clear point on this dinner the night before needs to be a yeah. very clean keto diet. That that's is right. not, that's not the time to be doing crazy fat bombs with half a cup of swerve in it. <laughs> yeah. Let's just stick with uh, chicken and broccoli or whatever for, for that night so that you have a, a nice clean catch because what's going to happen is if you have a little bit of carbs, it kind of messes with it. And if you have a cheat dinner, and then test your blood glucose, it, it'll be way higher than you think it would be. Wow. So def, definitely have, have a nice clean dinner. Then you wake up, you test it, and then you're, you're really looking for it to be under 100 and preferably under 90. Yeah. If it's over like 120, you, you have serious metabolic problems. Yeah, like over you, 120 is the threshold for prediabetes. That's what oh, they're looking for. Oh yeah. And that that's for people eating a carby diet. If yeah. if you're one if you're over 120 and you've been eating clean keto for a few weeks, that is uh that's profound. That is that's big time insulin resistance. I I would declare that to be uh, pretty severe. We have seen people that are over 150, 160 as high as 200. Yeah. That are I that is a, that's full blown diabetics though. Yeah. Those are, those are I think over 140 is what they're looking for for the diabetic threshold. Yeah. Those are people that have insulin, uh, 
uh, syringes in their house almost exclusively. Mm -hmm. So definitely a bummer if you find out that you are one of those people that, you know, for a lot of folks, you know, if you're your typical 45 year old person who's 40 pounds overweight, you're going to find out that your blood glucose fast, it's going to be 110, 120. That your, your health is not at risk. Let me be clear about that. Uh, the average human is going to be between 80 and 120 most of the time. Yeah. And that, so, so you're not at, in health jeopardy, but what you're doing is you're seeing evidence of a phenomenon that gives you an indication of how resistant your cells are to that insulin hormone, thanks to uh, what we call the Dawn effect in, in this graph. It's the Samaji effect, but it's all the same thing, right? Um, I think that this should be part of your journey back to health because when you reclaim that insulin resistance, you also reclaim your ability to manage nutrient uptake because you need insulin without insulin is not a bad hormone. Nope. It, we're not trying to get away from insulin. What we're trying to do is get insulin to be able to do its job because it's critical to your health and to your energy levels. Uh, whenever you see people talking about, oh, I'm tired and, uh, you know, I'm trying to work out on week two of keto and da 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 da, da. When you start chilling into it, you know, sometimes it's going to be salt, but a lot of times it's going to be they're, they're this crazy level of insulin resistance. So they're not able to uptake the glucose that they need and they're not fat adapted to be able to run on the ketones to, to help drive that. So they're in this in-between world where they're not really burning sugar because they're insulin resistant, but they're also not really uh, able to make the ketones that they need. So it's a, it's a really spooky place to be from an energy management perspective. Yeah. So one of the things that we talk about a lot is when we're looking at people's macros and stuff, let's say, uh, you know, uh, Sally Joe comes on here and, you know, 45 years old, 205 pounds, five foot five, uh, mm -hmm. that, she's probably going to be insulin resistant because she's more than 50 pounds overweight. And Fairly what likely. we're going to recommend is that after that third or fourth week, once that fat adaptation is complete so that all these energy and metabolism pathways have a chance to kind of wake up and really get cooking, you can do uh, a couple of things to really improve your insulin resistance. Number one, eating the low carb. So that'll be three weeks of eating yeah. a very low carb diet. You don't have insulin floating. When you're not eating sugar, when you're not eating bread, you don't have very much insulin floating around because you don't need it because there's not that much glucose floating around. The only glucose is coming from your liver. And unless you're uh, a type two diabetic, that's going to be a very normal and self-regulating amount of sugar. It's not going to be a crazy amount. So it just kind of works out. <laughs> but if you are uh, having trouble with that, then this fasting is one of the ways that you can approach uh, this insulin resistance. And if you think about it, fasting is a pretty simple thing. All fasting is, is saying, hey, don't put food in your mouth. Yeah. And give your body a chance to have a break from insulin. So if we look at this graph, uh, the chart actually says fat burning, but you can think about it in a different way, which is how much insulin and sugar is kind of floating around in your body. And the longer you go, the, the tipping point of how much insulin is floating around goes from being a, a normal amount, which you would expect, to not having any excess because you have that homeostasis, that perfect amount of blood sugar because you're making bo ketone bodies, you're making enough uh, sugar off your liver to keep your brain and central nervous system going. You don't really have any excess. You don't really have any shortage. It's just right. So then your insulin can kind of settle down a little bit. And when that happens, you're not bombarding those cells with insulin all the time, so they get to rest. And just like, uh, you know, you've got uh, folks who can drink one beer and get drunk, and then you have uh, people who 
uh, you know, go to hockey games every weekend and drink like mad, need a 12 pack <laughs> just to get a buzz. That's that, that's that resistance to drugs. You, your body just becomes desensitized to something that is exposed to every day. So the best thing that you can do to self heal without medication is to time your nutrient uptake to reduce that insulin level in your blood. And you're just doing a little bit every day. Uh, and there's definitely folks who can go hardcore and go multi-day on the fasting or whatever. But you can see from this graph, once you get past about hour 10, which is what most people do every day anyways. I mean, you eat dinner at 6. You don't, you don't have breakfast till 6 or 7 the next day. That's 10, 12 hours for most folks. You're already fasting. What we're suggesting is if you extend that fast just another four or five, six hours, mm -hmm. you can really get a, an extra, you know, 30, 40, 50 percent of rest, which lets your body heal and not be exposed to that hormone as much, which makes it more sensitive to the next time it is exposed. So, Karen, in, in your own experience, Mm -hmm. When you first started all this, I, I know uh, you had a, a pretty high fasted blood sugar. You we were concerned I that did, you were insulin. I was usually about 140. Yeah. So when, once when you started started. fasting, uh, what was the progression like for you? Um, it, you know, I, I was quite pleased with the progression. It is something that takes a very long time to resolve completely. Um, but I, I guess I started in March. Okay. Um, I started eating a ketogenic diet at the beginning of February. And um, in March, I was eavesdropping on you talking with somebody else about fasting. Hmm. <laughs> and it piqued my interest. So I decided to give it a try. Um, and I started doing it fairly regularly. I I tried the uh, the sixteen hour, and mm -hmm. then I I tried pushing it a little bit further, but I wasn't ready, so I I stuck to the sixteen hour. Okay. Um, within a month, uh, I was finding myself around one fifteen, one ten in the morning instead of the. Uh, the 140s that I wow. started off before uh, before beginning my ketogenic eating, that, now, and that's a lot. Twenty points is that's a big move. It's in, significant. In <laughs> that, that, that's a my big doctor move. is is very pleased. Oh, yeah. uh, now, uh, with exceptions of days that I you know I'm a little bit under the weather or it for some reason I've allowed myself to get dehydrated. Most mornings I'm I'm waking up in double digits. Wow, no, that's huge. I'm, I'm pretty impressed with that. And, and that, from a clinical definition, you have gone from pre-diabetic to normal. Normal, yeah. And yeah that, most mornings, I'm, I'm quite uh, quite normal. It's it's under 100. That, that's that's just a great story, Karen. I, I, you know, it's not something that came for free, though. You you had to work for that, and it, it took a few months to get down I, to that level. I did a lot. Yeah, I think in April... Um, I did a lot of alternate day fasting, so I was doing 36 hours, but you know what? I really didn't push it. As I said, I started off at 16 hours. Mm -hmm. I went to 18 and 20. I tried a couple of the 23-1, and I, I just didn't like how that made me feel. Okay. Um, and then I did a few more weeks of the 16 and eventually decided, you know what? I'll just try a whole day and see what happens. And it felt fine. I, I didn't feel tired or hangry or anything like that. So I'm, I've been keeping up on that sort of schedule uh, ever since. So I'm just going to throw up a graphic on our, our 16 hour fast since that, uh, yes. what we're kind of going to advocate at least for uh, today's discussion. When we're talking about fasting, what we're really trying to talk you into doing is to consider skipping breakfast. So and this is what I do most days, is the 16-8, the where I'll have uh, lunch and I'll have dinner and then just skip breakfast. And this graph is representing your blood insulin levels. When, when the graph is green, your insulin is very low and you're, you're resting those insulin receptors and giving your body a chance to heal and recover from that constant exposure. So you see a nice big peak at lunch, another big peak at dinner, and then all night long. 
And then by skipping breakfast, you get that extra, you know, four or five hours, which is, you know, 30, 40% improvement in the rest time. Now, one of the things that I want to call out is you hear a lot of us talk about don't snack. Yep. There's a reason for that. Imagine if you stuck a snack in the middle of this lunch and dinner graph, you would kind of have this continuous flow of insulin running across all at the whole time, which is exactly what you're not wanting to do. You, you want to keep your insulin low so that it can rest. You need insulin when you eat because it drives nutrients into your, into your body cells. But eat, then stop eating. Let the insulin do the work and get back to normal. Then have another meal. This is why uh, there's so many different intermittent fasting patterns. You, you hear us talking a lot of shorthand, like 16-8 or 24, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, 23-1 and stuff like that. What we're referring to is the eating window against the fasting window. Yeah. The eight-hour eating window is nice because when you eat a, a decent-sized meal, it takes four hours to kind of work itself out back to normal. So if you're eating in four hours and then you're eating again, at, you know, uh, six, seven hours later, you know, you're having your lunch at, uh, you know, 11 or 12, and then you're having dinner at five or six, that gives you a nice uh, turnaround time to go from normal to full, back to normal and back to full. You could compress this by eating an afternoon late lunch at, and, you know, uh, 20 hours of fast and then eat, eating dinner four hours later. The concern with that approach is that you never quite get back to normal because it takes four or five hours for a typical meal to get you back to normal. Yeah. It's not a bad thing because you've also extended your fast by another four hours. You've essentially doubled it over a normal person which gives you much better insulin rest. Mm -hmm. But you've also kind of hammered on the insulin receptors during that four hour window because you've eaten and then never given it a break and then eaten again. So it's kind of, uh, you know, one big red hump that's four hours long rather than, you know, having a chance to work through it. Mm -hmm. So, Karen, you mentioned that you were doing alternate day fasting. Talk a little bit about what that looks like and what your experience with that is. Um, well, for me, I eat dinner fairly late. My, my husband gets home and we eat dinner together. So for me, dinner's uh, between seven and eight. Okay. And then I would stop, <laughs> <laughs> um, stop eating. And I wouldn't eat the whole day the next day. Okay. Um, and then start again um, the day after that. So I had the 36 hours. Uh, some of that I'm sleeping. Sure. Um, but it, it just gave my, my, my body and my pancreas that whole day of rest in between. I know I did work myself uh, up to doing this. I, um, I did a whole lot of the, the 16, eight first. And then, you know, as I said, pushed it back a little mm -hmm. bit further and a little bit further until, until I was ready and I wasn't, uh, it wasn't forced and I wasn't feeling hungry. Right. When uh, you were fasting, what went in your mouth? Uh, <laughs> well, then uh, there was some diet soda and, and <laughs> sweeteners and that sort of thing. Um, now uh, it's water. Yes. Black coffee. And occasionally I will have uh, like black tea or green tea uh, without sweeteners or dairy. Okay. Um, now if I were to start adding things like um, it, heavy whipping cream, it mm -hmm. Technically, there, there isn't a lot of carbs in there. It's just fat, but it's also taking away, you know, a uh, hundred calories worth of fat that I could be burning. Right. So I tend to avoid that. 
Um, and occasionally, if I'm if I'm going for a longer fast, you know, if it, if it's going to be over forty two hours, uh, I will have some broth. But usually, it's water and black coffee. Okay. So is that is that your pattern or is that what you also recommend for others so you know think about uh, that, the, that's definitely you know. what i recommend um for others now there are some people uh who simply cannot do the fasting without uh, a little bit of fat in their coffee my sure. husband is one mm -hmm. um he typically doesn't have breakfast anymore but he does have uh, some fats in his coffee and that will carry him through uh, usually until about now, around three o'clock, he'll have his lunch. Okay. And then he'll eat again, you know, this is between uh, seven and eight when, uh, when he gets home. And, and do you feel like that's an effective way of uh, keeping both a, a calorie deficit and extending that fast, that insulin holiday? Definitely for him, it, it works perfectly. It keeps him, um, just satisfied and able to go the whole day he it's sort of like a meal replacement for him yes so he has it and then he's able to extend his fast another seven eight hours uh so that it's working for him and uh you know it's just it's just a different way of doing it i i don't notice any difference if i were to have fat in my coffee than if i were to have it black so oh, I, uh, I choose to do it the other way. So, so Karen, I, I want to be real clear that I, I'm hearing you correctly, which is you're saying a, a fast preferably is black coffee. That's but, the ideal fast is z zero calories. I mean, zero calories. even Fung will say, you know, if you have to add a splash of, you know, what. <laughs> What was it? A hummingbird's <laughs> a hummingbird's full, beak. <laughs> full of cream to your coffee. Then he's okay with it. But we do have a lot of people. My husband is one of them, who will have his fatty coffee in the morning, and that keeps him from experiencing any sort of, you know, ill feelings, grumbly, tumbly, um, brain fog, mm -hmm. any any of that sort of thing that uh, that some of our people get when. Uh, when they go more than 12, 14 hours without ingesting any calories. So if you are someone who has done the, the blood glucose test with diet soda and does not have a significant insulin reaction to diet Coke. Then you're fine. Then it's fine, right? It's fine. Yeah. If you're, but if you're like me and, and you're experiencing that drop, that's, that's telling you something very important and that your fast is not going to be as effective with with the sweeteners so the the three things that i, I just want to call out as compromises to an ideal fast yes number one calories yep any kind of calories be that be they fat or be they uh you know some kind of sugar like xylitol that has a few uh, calories in it mm -hmm. any kind of carbs is absolutely out of the question and then I think the third thing is when it comes to sweeteners, it's an individual situation. Are you someone who can put sweetener in your coffee without having trouble? And I'm not, and it's very sad. And that's a bummer for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible, I, but Mark can I, do what he wants. Right. <laughs> I, I'm uh, much like your husband. I, I can get away with murder. Yeah, I can I can sweeten that thing up until it's a milkshake and <laughs> it'll be fine. So there's one other uh, aspect of fasting. I just want to touch on this real quick. That's we'll save this for another show. There, there's another part of fasting that's really interesting called apoptosis, and it, what it has to do with is uh, cell regeneration. Yes. Your 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 body is constantly killing off cells and building new ones. You don't you don't just walk around with forty year old cells. There there are some interesting things that start happening, especially on the longer fast, like the 36, 42 hour fast that Karen was talking about, mm -hmm. where your body will kind of go, hey, uh, now would be a good time to get rid of any dead weight 
and build new ones because we are we are in a starvation kind of situation so it triggers this apoptosis which is fantastic because you're killing off all the weak dead old cells in your body mm -hmm. this is good for healing this is good for uh, you know your long-term health and for if you're longevity. one of these long yeah if you're one of these uh, life extension folks mm -hmm. fasting can promote life extension you hear people talking about calorie restriction all the time is a big part of life extension. And part of that is from th that program cell death that you're triggering by doing that. If you take even a tiny bit of calories or any protein, even just one gram of protein, you have half a turkey slice, you turn off that system for like six hours. So there, there can be no compromises with the, the cream or anything like that. If you're fasting for healing mm -hmm. from that perspective, now that's different than insulin at, you know, if you want to sneak in some coconut oil into your, your coffee, that's probably not going to make your insulin go up or down, but it is going to kick off those calories. And once those calories hit, it turns off that, that system. So if you're someone that's fasting for health and healing, I strongly suggest that you stick to water and, no zero calorie things that cause no insulin. So, you know, yeah. unsweetened black coffee, unsweetened tea, that sort of thing. All right. <laughs> well, Karen, that, that was a pretty good uh, dance around the maypole for insulin resistance. Is there anything that we wanted to talk about that we didn't get a chance to? I, I think we hit on everything. Yeah, I, th I think so too. It's a pretty good yeah. start into uh, insulin resistance. I, I do just want to add that if you're a full-blown diabetic, this is how you heal yourself. You yeah. you want to get off those shots. You want to get off that metformin that makes your tummy upset every day. This is how you do it. This is how Dr. Fung does it. This is why Dr. Fung has a nine-month waiting list for his clinical practice because people want to get off that medication and losing the weight is not the same as fixing your insulin resistance. Karen is still on her weight loss journey, but her insulin resistance is normal. She has reclaimed her insulin sensitivity through this nutrient timing in just a couple months. Yeah, I, it did not take long at all. That, that should be exciting for you. If you're a pre-diabetic or a full-blown type 2 diabetic, if, if metformin or glucophage or even, you know, full-blown injectable insulin is something that's part of your life, there's there are some ways to get out of this if you're type 2. Now, obviously, with type 1, that's a whole different thing. That's, that's, a, that, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking no. about type 2. So uh, that's why I'm really excited about uh, doing a lot of this ketogenic work too is because I love the idea of people being medication free simply through their own behavior. That is so nice. Mm -hmm. uh, I, when I hear about people having to prick their finger six or seven times a day and giving themselves shots, it just breaks my heart because all I have to do is stop eating the bun on their hamburger and yeah. problem solved. And, and that's the reason why you've noticed we talk a lot about the intermittent fasting um, in the groups. And it's because we know uh, through ourselves and seeing other members follow this program of uh, ketogenic eating coupled with the fasting, we've seen them go completely off medications and, and reverse these conditions that are considered to be progressive. Absolutely. And I'll even go so far as to say I, I can name more than five people who I've uh, seen go from being full blown diagnosed diabetics, injecting to insulin, injecting yep. insulin to no medications at all yep. in less than four months. I think the average is two or three months. It's it, just it really doesn't take very long to see some major progress. And that's an incredible thing when their doctor is telling them. They're in a progressive disease. That is doctor words for you will die with this disease and it will be worse then than it is now. Yeah. And meanwhile, don't eat the bun on your hamburger. <laughs> that, it's just that simple. And you can get off the medication completely and reverse your disease. Completely put it in remission just by flipping a switch. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're excited about it. That's why we're passionate about it. And meanwhile, back at the ranch. 
how does insulin resistance affect weight loss since we've been talking about insulin and diabetes so much let's just uh, it really I'm a, slows it down <laughs> it, uh, insulin resistance can really slow down your weight loss how? if you're constantly you know, you know hitting up those those receptors is making you dump insulin yeah you will hang on to fat and you, you right. don't want to be doing that if you're overweight insulin is like a light switch if there's insulin in your blood you do not have the ability to get fat out of your fat cells. It's stuck in there because while the light switch is on, fat, the energy goes into the cells. You have to have the insulin switch off in order to get fat out of it. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's another interesting piece of this that, you know, that when we talk about intermittent fasting, it's not a weight loss tool. No. But, but what it can do yeah. is it, it can optimize your opportunity to liberate the fat on your caboose. Yes. So it's not it's not a good way of losing weight. You're not going to put yourself into some deep calorie restriction. No, that that's not why I do it. And you know, I I do eat properly, eat within my macros. Sometimes even to a little bit of a surplus if I'm hungry. <laughs> um, that when I do eat, it's just the times in between that are crucial. So what it, the fasting is not for the weight loss. It's for reducing my insulin resistance, which increases my weight loss. Correct. And I, I know that from talking with a lot of people, that's other people's experience as well. Yeah. You, if you improve that insulin resistance, you will get the insulin out of your blood faster, which means you spend more time in the green and less time in the red, which means more burning, less storage. Yeah. And that that's what it's about. And those are that that's why we're passionate about it. That's why we uh, talk, talk about, about it this constantly. kind of stuff. <laughs> and it, it's not that insulin's bad. No. It, it's that while insulin is humping, it's not furthering your goal of weight loss or blood sugar control. That's right. All right. Well, why don't we end that here, Karen? Because yeah. I, I think you and I could probably go uh, around the uh, merry-go-round a few times on that just because so, you and I are so excited about the healing and the the opportunities that this sort of stuff can bring to people who are sick. That's right. And, uh, you know, I I think this is this is a good start. We will probably do another session where we talk about the mechanics of fasting a little bit more. I think people have questions. They want to know about bone broth. They want to know about using carbonated water to settle stomachs. Yeah. How, how do you get your salt in on an empty stomach without getting diarrhea? You know, all <laughs> of, <laughs> There are a lot of questions that we see come up over and over again. So that, that'll definitely be one of our upcoming episodes uh, to get into that because I know that folks have questions and we'll get to it. I had a lot of questions too, if you remember. <laughs> I do. <laughs> Constant questions, yeah. Yes. All right, Karen. Well, thank you for uh, helping me uh, get through this topic, and uh, we will see everyone next time. See ya.